five, four. We now return to Lickety Split making music. Mr. Morton, he's like, uh, if he's our timekeeper. Okay, so see, he's the referee of the whole thing too. Uh, that's the way I think of him. He keeps the whole beat and tempo of the songs. There's always, in symphony works, there's always changing tempos, okay? And he also sets the dynamic level. And, you know, even his whole uh, attitude, like you might see him up there on a really fast part, he might be going, you know, really getting into the music. On other parts, he might have his eyes closed and just swinging back and forth. And it sets even the mood for you, how to play the music. You see him swinging, so you start to swing. Okay, and if he's really up there intense, you want to be intense too, you know. That's how violinist Neil Phillips described Fred Morden, conductor of the Altoona Symphony Orchestra. If you've ever seen a performance by the orchestra, you've seen Mr. Morden standing in front of the orchestra. That's his job as conductor. But he has a job you don't see, and he does some of that work right here at the Altoona Public Library. Mr. Morden, could you tell me what are you doing here today? Well, Monica, I'm doing some research on the music that the symphony is going to play. Um, besides just conducting the orchestra and sort of leading them through performances, uh, I try to do some research and find out what the performance practices of the time that the music was written were, and also do some work uh, upstairs about the lives of composers. Here were the recordings that they've done, and here are some of the parts themselves, the violin parts, that we try to organize their parts so that they all bow together so that it, the music is easier to make. So Mr. Morden is making music easier to make, working alone before he stands in front of the orchestra, before the orchestra makes music, music earlier chosen by a special selection committee on which Mr. Morden serves. But Mr. Morden isn't the only one doing his homework. Doris Paisley, personnel manager, librarian, and first violinist for the Altoona Symphony Orchestra is busy marking music for her fellow violinists. Part of her job is to mark the bowings for each player. Could you explain how you put the bowings into the different parts? Well, I sometimes have the score that I work with that has all the parts there. And I look at the different string parts of violins, the violas, cellos, and basses, and I try to coordinate all the parts so that everybody's bow is moving the same direction at the same time so that it looks better that way from the audience too and for sound purposes it's better while talking to mrs paisley i asked her to describe music well music is a, a wonderful experience and any musician could could attest to that uh, it gives you a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment and um, at a concert if you play well uh, you just have a, a, a wonderful feeling of a high that you couldn't get any other way that just is an elated feeling and it's just a very, very satisfying experience. A very satisfying experience that doesn't always come easy. Making music usually doesn't happen overnight. It takes practice. You know the old saying, practice makes perfect. a student at Hollidaysburg Area High School and a member of the Altoona Symphony Orchestra. She also has homework to do before making music with the rest of the orchestra. First, she gets the music that she will play, looks it over, listens to a recording of the music, practices alone at home. Then, Linda takes her music to Mrs. Paisley's house where she joins another high school student, Neil Phillips. Together, the two orchestra members make music with a little help from Mrs. Paisley. So you want to play at the bridge and, um, and a tremolo, and then a crescendo on the second measure to a fortissimo on the pizzicato. So let's just take it right there, the uh, fourth measure. <laughs> Four. 
when I get here, I get a real workout, so to speak. Um, I can go over things that I might have missed, and she points out new things like Boeings and stuff that uh, really are beneficial, and so everybody, you know, looks good on stage. And uh, I just get a, I can learn a lot more, and she teaches me, you know, new techniques. There might be new stuff I've never even seen before in the symphony music. And uh, I can go over it and learn to play it better. Practice, practice, practice. These two practice alone, together, with Mrs. Paisley, and with the entire string section, all before they get together with the entire orchestra. I guess you could say they're rehearsing for the rehearsal. But then at the first rehearsal, I think it's most, it, um, it's most important because when you first go in, you hear all the instruments for the first time playing together. You know exactly how Mr. Morden wants to take the tempo and where you should play louder and where you should play softer. And then after that, you just go back home and you prepare for the next rehearsal because you know what he wants. So make sure that you do it that way. When I first got there, it was kind of, it's a little bit um, uh, uh, awe-striking that, um, like, um, like uh, since I'm one of the few kids in the orchestra, and I wasn't sure if I would be able to keep up. But if you practice a lot and everything, I think um, I feel at home in the orchestra. I still sit, like, I sit in the back, or, like, we have a rotating section now, and I just try to play my part well, and I'm getting to know the people in the orchestra. So um, I think that I fit in pretty well. Do you have to concentrate really hard when you're playing with the or entire orchestra? Yeah, I do. I concentrate more there. Uh, you know, always sitting up and ready to go so I don't miss a thing because it's, you know, it's a lot of work. It's hard to do. You know, it, it might look easy sitting up there, but uh, no way, you know. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, you know. And it, it's not easy sitting up there. For the most part, since you're just concentrating so much on making sure that you're playing your part right and watching the conductor, I think you hear yourself more than the rest of the orchestra. And it's Mr. Morden's job to concentrate on everybody and everything. Well, I basically, I do two things. I, I determine how fast and how slow they play. Fast or slowly. Uh, and also, I, I help them decide and help uh, them play in a way that makes makes music and that is the interpretation of it whether or not the phrases uh, uh, get louder or softer sometimes or the rate at which uh, the imitation of the different voices is done back and forth is largely determined by me and there's a, another thing that I do that's a very subtle thing and that is to encourage the players to do things like um, if I didn't want you to play a certain thing uh, very loudly, then I would do something very subtle. I did not look at you or put my hand up like this. Or if I wanted to encourage you, I would reach out to you a little bit to have you play more. And in that way, if the conductor is very smart and knows the score, his conductor's score, all throughout the whole performance, he can look at the various instruments as they're playing and encourage them in certain ways to play. Sometimes it may be just a little thing, just maybe looking like if someone were in the audience playing, just a look, just a quick glance, sometimes is better than turning to them and you know, having them play. They don't need all that. Some, like players like yourself who have had experience playing, you only need a little bit of encouragement, where others, you know, you might need to encourage a lot. When I was younger, uh, I heard it all sounded like wow to me. And as I had more and more experience uh, conducting, I actually began to hear everything that was going on so that if I was conducting the violins over here, I could still hear the violas and cellos and basses at the same time. Lickety Split, making music will continue.
four. We now return to Lickety Split Making Music. Hours of research, hours of preparation, hours of practice. Everybody spending hours of time for that one moment when it all comes together. Members of an orchestra use their instruments to make music. Members of a choir use their voices. The Keystone Chorale is practicing for their next concert. Unlike instrumental players, who practice at home and in small groups first, choir members usually learn their parts together as a group. But director Dennis Villani prepares months before the choir gets together to practice. I have to sit down at the piano and I have to be able to play the piece myself. And I have to be able to know what to do so I can teach it, just like a teacher in a classroom. A teacher has to know that two and two equals four before they go to the classroom and teach the students. They have to know that cat is C-A-T to be able to teach to the students. In teaching the music to the chorale, I have to know the musical notes. I have to know where the words go. I have to know where they breathe. I have to know all those things first myself before I can go to, into the rehearsal with all those people and teach them the music. are from all over Altoona with many different backgrounds. There are teachers, hairdressers, business owners, and even high school students. Matt Ponser is a senior at Bishop Guilfoyle High School in Altoona. Hi, Matt. How are you? Pretty good. Thank you. That's good. First thing I'd like to ask you, Matt, what are your feelings about working with the choir and singing with them? How do you feel about that? Oh, I really enjoy it because most of the people involved with the choral are much better musicians than I am. So it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of practice. And when you finally put it together, you really feel you've accomplished something working with such a good group. And it's, it's really a, a good experience for someone as young as I am. Matt, along with all members of the chorale, have to audition to be in the choir. They must be able to read music. That's the first qualification. The second qualification is I'm looking for a certain timbre or voice color. And if I feel that that color is going to blend in with the rest of the people in the choir, then I feel that person has successfully uh, passed the audition. I don't look for someone who has a wide vibrato, like a ba 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 because that's going to stick out. But I want someone with a real pleasant, easy, silvery line kind of voice. And that's the best kind of voice for a choral situation. Sometimes Mr. Villani plays the organ and conducts the choir at the same time. But, no matter how he does it, he always feels a oneness between the choir and the audience. It's like, I have a piece of candy, and I love it, and you watch me eat it. And then you say, well, I wish I had a piece. So I give you a piece of candy. So we're both sitting there, and we're both enjoying a candy bar. And it's the same type of thing with the choir and the audience. Ten, 
nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. We now return to Lickety Split making music. Music to me is a lot like poetry. It has a theme, style, words, and a rhythm. But it's more than that because it has the intonation, the loudness, the building. And it just takes it one step beyond that because it's more than just reading. It has, it has that intonation. That's what separates music from poetry. It's a sharing of the different feelings and emotions. The choir, my organ playing, we can make somebody sad. We can make them feel melancholy. We can make them feel very, very happy. And we all do that with the art form of music. And so we're playing in a respect to people's feelings and their emotions. We can make them feel sad or we can make them feel happy. And that's a very powerful medium to be able to do that. I know a lot of people think this it's a lot of fun.